very well, but I'm after getting a small bit of a spiritual ego. How do I fix it? Now, I know I wouldn't be getting that if I wasn't still living in hindrances, but I'm starting to get a spiritual ego. Spiritual legal, I don't understand. No, ego. What? Tell me what you're talking about. Because my practice is going well, and I've I've found that, like I've been, I'm, I'm a lot more generous for the right reasons, for for good reasons. But because of that, and because I'm living better, I kind of I'm I there's a small bit of arrogance growing, if that if that makes sense. Okay, so what is the problem with arrogance? Well, I, I don't want to ha ha have a bit of an ego. I don't want people to think I'm a dick. Not that I really care about what people think of me, but I feel it's because of my good practice and I'm going well, I'm living well, I'm getting on well with people. I'm, I feel that's making me a small bit arrogant. All right. Well, let's put it this way. You were mentioning nobles a moment ago. Would a noble be arrogant? I don't think so, even though I don't think I've ever met anyone, only you. All right. Would you think then that someone could make a mistake and consider someone that is noble arrogant when in fact he's not? Well, I give you an example. I was walking through the No, hospital. no, answer my question. Um, could they could think he's arrogant, but he might be not. I'm, I'm sure that's possible. Well, it is because people are foolish about all kinds of things. I mean, they murdered Jesus, didn't they? True. They, they poisoned Socrates, didn't they? They did. All right. And that there was at least uh, more than actually four occasions when uh, someone tried to take the Buddha's life. And oh. that in the end, he was poisoned, just like Socrates. Serious. Not. That's exactly what happened. Wow, I didn't know that. It's in two places. It's in the Udana and then it's in the uh, Mahapiri Nibbana Sutta, number 16 and the Dinga Nikaya. Okay. And what poison it was, they're still trying to figure it out, whether it was mushrooms or bad pork. They don't know because we don't know the translations of the Pali words. Okay. All right. So here's the point then that ordinary people make ordinary mistakes all the time. They don't know what they're looking at. Now, let's take it from the other perspective. The noble actually has higher quality behavior because he has uh, more noble thoughts, which means they're not unwholesome thoughts. Right. And yet he knows that his then morality is higher, superior to the ordinary person. Okay. Okay. So knowing that one is better than someone else is not a problem. That in fact, real arrogance is when somebody is pretending to be better than someone else. So if a, if a grandmother go, goes out in the yard and finds a baby animal, she'll pick up the animal and take it into the house and nurture it and take care of it, right? Because she's compassionate and she understands that this animal needs help and that she can give it help. Does that make her arrogant? No. Okay. Well, then you and I have a different definition of the word arrogant. Because I see being arrogant as absolutely fine. It's okay. It's a recognition that you're actually better than other people. Just don't rub it in. Take care of them instead. Okay. Okay. Um, I tell you one thing. I told you that I've experienced a few days of the Janus. I, do you know what? Even when I came out of them, I still I think for fucking a couple of weeks later. I was a better person, even just after experiencing them for a few days. Would, would, would that would that be right? Yeah, things linger on. The skills that you were developing that got you into the first jhana, those skills are still there. 
you develop them as skills. If you let them, uh, if, if they fall into disuse, they'll get rusty. Okay. So you have to keep them going. You have to uh, keep keep exercising right noble thinking. Yeah, but there uh, is residual benefit that if you get into the habit of thinking in a wholesome way, then later you'll just automatically begin to think in more wholesome ways. Not an issue, not a problem. It's expected. Right. Okay, then, Morales. So my... I wanted to get the spiritual ego question out of the way first. So when I go to the gym a lot, okay? When I'm in the gym, I I can get in and around the, the first jan because I can get a hold, I can get a momentum of wholesome thoughts one after the other and I'm mindful of what I'm doing in the gym. However, it's it doesn't feel as joyful as the first jana I've experienced that I got from meditation. But would the jhana I'm getting in the gym, would, it still have, would that have as much uh, benefit as the uh, jhana where I'm really, really joyful? It or, depends upon the skills that you're including and in use. That, in fact, in the gym, most people who are in the gym are in the gym because they want something with the thought process of no pain, no gain. So that whole point about stressing the body to exercise it puts the body in a state of discomfort. If the body is in a state of discomfort when you're exercising, then that's going to detract from the, uh, uh, the sukha, which has comfort built in. So that's the answer to your question. Are you comfortable? Can you get comfortable while you're working out? Oh, big time, big time. And I can see now why yoga is beneficial for some spiritual work because a lot of the time after I do my legs, I'm stretching. And when I'm stretching, I'm focusing on my stretch, but I'm also using wholesome thoughts. And that really gets the fucking whole... I'm able to use that. I'm, the gym is actually more enjoyable since I'm practicing my fucking spiritual work in the gym with my lifting weights. Mm-hmm. And I can get into a wholesome thought after a wholesome thought for a good bit in and around the first jhana, but it's not as joyful as the first jhana I've experienced from meditation. And that's probably okay. because you mentioned the oxygen going into the brain from the breath, maybe. Yes, but in fact, um, maybe you have heard of this before, but there is a second or in a third heart that we have more than one heart. One of them is in the chest, and that's what does most of the pumping, but leg muscles. When you're out walking or running or weightlifting or doing anything that's exercising the muscles in the legs, when you contract that muscle, guess what? It pushes blood. Where does it push the blood? Up. So Did you relax it? And the and the bl blood comes down back and down through the uh, the arteries and whatnot. And when the muscles recontract, then the mu then the blood is squeezed up back into the arteries. I mean, the muscles of the legs performs exactly the same function as the muscle of the heart, but the muscle in the heart is a little more sophisticated. But that's all. This is why people who are exercising and uh, on walks they uh, can gain great benefit out of it simply because they're oxygenating the body to do so. Right. As well as breathing. That some people, in fact, would say that uh, most of the benefit from exercise doesn't come exactly from the exercise itself. It comes from the cardiovascular changes it's not the muscles that gain all the benefit. It's the fact that you're breathing better. Okay. And going and taking a walk, people breathe better than when they're just sitting. This is why in Anapanasati, we've taken emphasis upon the only exercise that we're going to do is the exercise of breathing, but we're going to do that very well. Okay. So that's why that's why we practice Anapanasati, but walking meditation also is getting that cardiovascular system going. 
Okay, so he- tell me this. I have tried walking. Med- I'm, I'm fucking trying my meditation in all my life. When I'm walking in the car, when I'm walking around the house, when I'm ra- anywhere. Can you give me, like, I'm focusing on my movement when I'm walking and I'm focusing on my breath sometimes. Is it, is it as simple as that, walking meditation? Mm-hmm. Yes. Being in the here now, focusing on the walking, focusing on the breathing, being in the present moment has a great deal of benefit as compared to worrying about the uh, argument you had with Aunt Jane two weeks ago. Brilliant. Yeah, and you know what? This is going to tie into another question as well because uh, I was watching an old video of you and Danny a couple of years ago and you spoke about... You know, uh, you spoke about um, to have all your senses open and and not to take an object and just let happen whatever happens. And that's what I was doing in my run. And it was a very enjoyable run. I was just letting my awareness fucking fluctuate up and down my body to the different senses, to the bread hitting off my face or to the wind hitting off my face. My hair blowing, my legs hitting the ground, and it was it was one it was a lovely run I had. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, and Buddha Dasa talks about it as well, Damarao. He talks about heaven, oh, no. heaven arises at the senses. So can you use that as a meditation? Just let that is the meditation, is your senses. So long as it's the five senses. The sixth sense is the mental which in fact is conceptualizations and everything that we conceptualize is something from the past. But all the other five senses, when we take data in, it's brand new data in the present moment. So staying in your sensory awareness is the only way to stay in the here now. And is that what gives you, is that what shows you what true reality is when you can get all them senses opened up working together? Or at the little separate mind moments. Is that what gives shows you impermanence or something like that? Or well, it's much more real that there is a whole lot of reality that you will never have anything for because you cannot accept that data. That you can only accept the data that comes in the five senses, but most people are not even taking in the data that's available in the five senses because they're too busy thinking about something. They're too busy processing rather than sensory input. Okay, so so say if you got really good at opening up all your senses and being here now. Would that be enough to make you get you into nobility if you got really good at opening all your senses, opening all your When you are in your senses, that is noble. Don't well, make the kind of distinctions that you're making. You 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 have a lot of Western ideas about attainments and things like this. And these things are quite natural. The problem with the word jhana is is that Western Buddhism has made a big deal out of it. Where in fact it's a natural state of being. I tell you something, from my experience with it, it is a fucking big deal because it was pretty nice. Well, it is nice, that's right, but it is not special in the sense of uh, an attainment, that there is nothing to attain. There are merely skills to be developed. Okay. That, that jhana is not a, a, a an attainment. It's and something to be enjoyed. It's prob- that's probably what's stopping me from getting right there to the good one now because I pro- I, I'm i kind of, oh, when is it going to come? When is it going to come? Not all the time, but sometimes. And I, I know, okay. And when, it, when you are asking, when is it going to come? When is it going to come? Imagine there you are standing at the bus stop waiting for the bus to come. And you're having the thoughts, when is the bus going to come? When is the bus going to come? And you look at your watch and the bus just came and left you. Okay. Okay, that's really what's going on. When's it going to come? When's it going to come? You missed it. Okay. 
You're I, always are missing it because actually the right way of saying this is when is it going to come? When is it going to come? Means you want something that you don't have and you're waiting it for it to come. Yeah. Guess what? Never does because you're already now in a state of wanting something that you don't have. You have to come out of the state of wanting something that you don't have and be happy and satisfied with that which you do have because you can become comfortable and satisfied and happy right now. That's the state of the jhana. When you want jhana, you're not in the state of jhana. You're in a state of desire. Okay. Dukkha. I've heard you say that a couple of times. Mm-hmm. That's the whole point. It's, it's that you need to stop wanting jhanas or wanting something and just relax and enjoy what you've got. And that's the jhana, is to relax and enjoy. I've been watching, I, uh, who would have started that? He's, he's, uh, he's training or he's this, but he's doing like what I'm doing and he's practice would have started around the same time as me, and he was getting into the jammers, jannas around the same time as me as well. Scott. Well, you don't know that. You just hear what he's saying. Right, okay, yeah, yeah. Because you don't know, no one knows the state of one, of anyone else's mind. Okay. You don't know what he, just because he said something doesn't make it true, and it doesn't also, even if it's true, doesn't mean anything. Until jealousy comes in. Oh, he's got something I want. I'm not feeling like that now. <laughs> okay. If if uh, you want something that you don't have, when is it going to come? When is it going to come? And he's got it. Then, of course, jealousy is going to be there. That's the part of jealousy is I want something that I don't have. I tell you and most of the time, people want something that somebody else has rather than wanting something that doesn't exist. That's very, very rare. Uh, but I mean, do you know what? I have a small little business as well, okay? And since I got it, I, I got a little attachment. I got an attachment to money that I never had before. But after the, after the few days of a really gladdened mind, the, my attachment to money still has not come back. I'm a lot more generous, even after okay. that. Well, congratulations for that. But it's obviously the grat it's gratitude bad. and and uh, generosity is uh, a noble trait that we can develop, a well, skill to be developed. Well, I didn't try to develop it; I just developed naturally from my practice for some reason. Okay. So that's strange, but it's good. Well, if you have generosity feelings, but you don't practice it by giving something to someone, then that's not going to mean much. So you're actually are practicing it when you are generous. Well, fair enough. It's more of us on a subconscious level. So I think. Well, when you feel good about yourself, then you don't feel like you need so much. That you've got enough when you practice having enough generosity is a natural outcome of having the attitude that you've got enough. Okay. In fact, it's not just enough. You become absolutely wealthy. Wealthy with the Dhamma. And when you're, so, you know, when, when your mind is really gladdened, oh my God. Sometimes I struggle to sit for 10 minutes. So oh, I could have fucking sit for 24 hours in my meditation when my mind was gladdened. My, when my mind was glad, it all was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. At one stage, Damarato, I had a little experience where it was like in my mind, I zoomed in on my pineal gland and zoomed back out. It happened very quickly. But I, do you do you know what that was about? I think it might have even been my pineal gland, but something to zoomed in is like in well, my the head. word. The word pineal gland is a concept. Okay. That where the pineal gland is inside the body. And so you can pay attention to where the pineal gland is inside of the body. There's actually two of them on both sides of the back of the head. And it's okay to pay attention to the back of your neck. It's okay to pay attention to your throat. 
Then, in fact, the amygdala is very close to the back of the throat, that area of the brain that uh, generates uh, fear. And so paying attention to what the mind and the brain is actually doing through sensation is a very good practice. And it's right here, right now. You're not thinking about or feeling the, the penal gland the way that the penal gland was last month. You're feeling the way that it is right here, right now. Or at least you're experiencing the back of the neck, the back of the head. Um, so that would be the way of beginning to think about it rather than naming it. Just stay with the sensations of it. Well, I don't know what you call, well, I suppose you, you would recall, it was like I could see it, it just zoomed in and zoomed out, it just happened very quickly. Um, but anyway, it was, that was only an experience. So come here, do you know of any, I, I've been looking for any, um, ha, ha, is there any good uh, meditation or Buddha centers in around the UK or Ireland that you know of that might do retreats? Uh, there, there's one here in Ireland, I think it's called Dot Gin, Dog Gin or something like that, but they're charging a lot of money. And if they charge a lot of money, does that mean that there might not be nobles there? Or if there were nobles, would they be charging a lot of money? Like, um, First off, I will say that this is my opinion but that my opinion has a lot of backup that is based upon a lot of knowledge of uh, things in the past uh, in the sense of what's in the suttas, the way that the monks operate and all kinds of things like that. I've come to the position that Western business, uh, Western Buddhism is primarily broken by money. And that anyone who is teaching the Dhamma and wanting money from it has no Dhamma to give. Okay. They're selling something they don't have. That's enough said. And one of the things about it, we've just talked about generosity. Someone who is charging money is not practicing generosity. Now, are they? No. OK, so how can someone teach generosity if he's not exhibiting it to his students? Then, in fact, the students will try to emulate the teacher. They'll want to start charging money the same way that he does. OK. So one can then say then that someone who is charging money for whatever they're doing loves money more than what they're doing. Okay. An example of that is a dentist. Someone who is a dentist and really loves to be a dentist, he's probably going to do more pro, pro bono work, that he's going to do dentistry on someone just because they need it. But most dentists are in it for the money. Okay, most psychologists are in it for the money. OK, so the psychology comes second place or the dentistry comes second place. And the primary point is eating first. And helping others second, which is fair enough to a certain extent. Well, it's fair enough for the ordinary world. It's fair enough for the masses. It's fair enough for the seven billion. OK, OK, but it is not noble that the noble is the one who holds the Dhamma as number one in his life. But that's actually the practice of becoming a Sotapan is dedication. And I'm when I say dedication, that's not the right word, nor is the word devotion. The correct word would be eagerness. Eagerness. Eagerness, enthusiasm. That we that that's all that we want. That in the suttas, one of the stories is the story of a cow who has a new calf. And while she is eating grass, she still has an eye on that calf. She's looking after that calf and she's going to position her body between the forest and the field 
uh, or let us say in the field that she's in, she's going to position her body in order to give the calf the most safety. She only cares about the calf. Okay, the second item on that list then would be the monk who is in the watt, even though he's got monkly duties like sweeping or uh, carrying water or something like that. He still is more interested in the Dhamma, that that's what he really cares about. And the sweeping, he'll do the sweeping, but while he's doing the sweeping, his eye is on the Dhamma. Okay. Enthusiasm. Okay, this is what we're looking for, just enthusiasm and eagerness for the Dhamma. When the Dhamma becomes the important thing, then groceries or eating becomes secondary. It's not important. Now, monks in the watch, they already have the lunch taken care of. They go on bend about. It's a, it's a tradition that works. Also, uh, you can think of uh, that the bendabat or the going out for alms food, going to people's houses to get their leftovers from yesterday's meal is an act of allowing the person to be generous while the monk is exhibiting gratitude. Okay. Okay, so the whole idea of generosity and donations is well, well defined within Buddhism, but guess what? It is in all religions that part of the Christian teaching is, is to be generous, to take care of one another. And this is why they don't charge money for Christianity. So, in fact, in that regard, I would say that Christianity has a leg up on Western Buddhism because Western Buddhism is bought into the business model and Christianity has managed to stay out of it. Now, Asian Buddhism is in that generosity model, Donna, everything is open and freely available and we share. It's communistic. Okay. Because we live in community with one another and we share. But Western society is capitalistic. Okay, which means that that's where the ego or that's where the money is or I'm taking benefit. And it becomes a business deal, a business arrangement. Now, in almost all business arrangements, uh, let me ask you this in this way. If you were buying something and it was at price X, wouldn't you like to have a discount? Would you like for it to be X minus Y? Or do you really want to play X for it? Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, of course, I'd like a discount. Yes. Yeah. All right. So that's the whole point is, is that when one charges money for something, then he is actually breaking the second precept, because in the second precept, we only receive that which is freely given. But when somebody doesn't want to give freely, they are paying the price. They don't want to pay the price, but they're willing to pay the price because they want the benefit then the person who is requiring them to pay the price is actually not taking the money that's freely given. It's coerced. Okay. And so what we're looking for is freely given. That's why I don't charge any money for anything. I don't even advertise. I don't even take Donna. I give my teachings freely because it came to me from Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa and Achan Po freely. They they really helped me. They cared about me and they wanted my own benefit. They did not charge me money for it. Yeah, who did you say? Uh, was it Ajahn Po or Ajahn Cha? You said asked you to come on to on, on to the online and, and start doing what you're doing here on YouTube. Pardon? Do, who did you say asked you to come online? What you're doing now? Was it Ajahn Po or Ajahn Chah? Ajahn Po. Ajahn po. So you, you were more friendly with him first before Buddha Dasa. You said he always looked after you or something. Is that what you said? Yes. My my uh, main connection was with Ajahn Po. And how did you become more friendly with Buddha Dasa then? Through Ajahn Po. Okay. okay. But, but and, uh, that's... That's, yeah, I'm surprised then that you didn't take, 
Did you have Ajahn Po as a teacher so as well as Buddha Dasa? The word Achan is the word for teacher. Oh, so they were both your teacher. Mm hmm. And Damarao, this is a question, a question I wanted to ask you as well. I've heard you saying a couple of times you meditated for 10 years before you came to Buddha Dasa. I think it was 10 years and you meditated for another five years when you were with Buddha Dasa. So does that mean you don't meditate anymore? What is meditation anyway? But you know what I mean? You, you know what I mean? Come on now. <laughs> but, but like. So I do that... not, nor do I ever recommend anyone do anything that is called meditation that copies something from Mahase or Gawanka or uh, Hinduism or any of that kind of stuff. Then, in fact, if there is a meditation that I would recommend, it's to remove unwholesome thoughts and put wholesome thoughts in the place. And yeah. that's not taught in Goenka, and that's not taught in Mahasi. That's taught by the Buddha. It is to remove unwholesome thoughts and put wholesome thoughts instead, to gladden the mind, to brighten the mind. And with that, that's the beginning of Anapanasati. Okay. My little man there has run up and down the hall, Damaretto. I don't know. If you can hear him, but I just want to give you one more quick question, if that's OK. From your experience, what are the mechanics of the first jhana that makes it the path to enlightenment? Does it quench the ego or is it the fact that it just gets rid Actually, of the whole? Actually, being in first jhana is being enlightened. In well, I tell moment. And when you are in the first jhana, you are enlightened. And when you're not in first jhana, you're not. Now, I, it's not a matter of progression and progression. Let us say many people have the idea that it's kind of like we live on a plateau and we've got a long distance over to that edge of that plateau. And when we reach the edge of it, we jump off the edge and now we're in free fall over the edge. And that's not at all what it's like. In other words, we have in our system of thought, in Western thought, we have a clock or we have a time frame or we have the idea of not now, later. And the teachings of the Buddha and the whole mindset is about what are we doing right now? What are we doing right now? If we are gladdening the mind right now, then we're gladdening the mind right now. If we're enlightened right now, then we're enlightened right now. Okay. And when we're not in gladdening the mind, then we're not enlightened. And we go up and down, back and forth. Sometimes you feel like a nut. Sometimes you don't. The question is, can you begin to control that cycle so that you spend more time in being wholesome and less time being in a d dukkha? Well, I can you know what? For and the, the answer to that is, can you remember? That's the sati. Can you remember to come out of your crap and come into uh, a good state of mind? Yeah, but sorry, here's my little man in there now. Thanks for taking the call, Damaratto. And uh, yeah, I tell you, for the few days I was in first gen, uh, considering how I used to live, I was fucking pretty enlightened for them few days, I tell you. So all you have to do is sustain it to get yourself into it is first skill and then being able to maintain it, which means that you don't allow unwholesome thoughts to come back into the mind. And is it possible to continue that good, joyous feeling day after day after day for weeks and weeks on end? No, minute after minute after minute is the only goal that you should have. Can I sustain it for a little while longer? Let me get it another one minute. Well, can you do it day then after minutes and minutes and minutes off into the future that turn into days and days and weeks and weeks off into the future we don't know about we only know about right now so become oriented towards right now when you think about it off into the future that brings in desire okay but but you know like when you're in first jana for a long amount of time 
does it not use up some kind of resources, say like dopamine or something like that, and then you're all flat after a long period of time being in first jana? No. What you're saying is you don't like it when you came out of first jhana. So why don't you just get yourself right back into it? Because after all, it's nothing but an attitude. I don't know. There was a taste of something in it that was a bit more. There was something else in there. It was a bit more just an attitude, I think. There was a feeling, a physical feeling of joy in there. Okay. That's also an attitude. Is it? Mm-hmm. How are you, baby? Hey, go on. Thanks very much, and I'll chat to you again. Okay, we'll see you. You will indeed. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye, bye-bye.